Okay, well, it's so nice to, you know, gradually be coming back to normal. And uh, I'm delighted to see you all here. And thank you very much for coming uh, tonight. So a really warm welcome to you all. And tonight, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Leslie Pullen, who's here tonight to launch her book entitled Patterned uh, a Splendor. And it's about uh, the textiles found on metal and stone sculpture, uh, uh, Javanese sculptures uh, between the 8th and the 15th centuries. And this, of course, was the subject of her thesis, which she completed at SOAS in 2017. Uh, Leslie is a member of the RAS, and in fact, last spoke here in 2011 um, on the Naga material culture. Um, she's taught and uh, lectured widely on Asian art, but uh, I think textiles remain her preeminent interest, uh, judging by her publications. Um, and as she said uh, herself um, in a note to me, that she's very, very proud to be a later starter uh, in her academic career and is encouraging any others to, to, to follow. And I would also like to uh, welcome and thank Dr. Stephen Murphy, uh, the Prata Paditya Pal Senior Lecturer in Curating and Museology um, of Asian Art at SOAS, who has um, really very kindly agreed to act as discussant tonight. And it's very nice to, to see him. The last time I saw him was in Singapore. <laughs> so, a very warm welcome to you. So, without Going on and on, I'm going to hand over to Leslie to tell us about textiles on Japanese sculpture. Thank you very much. Okay, <clears throat> this is all right. Everybody can hear. Thank you, Alison, very much um, uh, for inviting me and for Matty for getting everything set up and for Stephen for supporting me and being here. I've known Stephen on and off since we were sort of students at SOAS and I want to also thank Elizabeth Moore, who was my first professor at SOAS for being here. So her being here makes me even more tremble in my shoes. <laughs> so let's get started. This, this sculpture and this book was chosen for their unique textile patterns, really an aspect of Javanese art history, which has not been attempted before. In addition, Pattern Splendor has highlights how society during this period was heavily involved in the transference of goods from across the region both to and from Java and Sumatra. The end result was a diverse textile patterns decorated onto the statues. I'd like to dedicate this lecture in honor of Jan Wiseman Christie, a famous scholar who died early this year. Her work on the text and textiles in the 1990s was instrumental in so many aspects of my research. Also something else about this book is a follow on from a 1980 conference at the Textile Museum in Washington, DC and the publication was edited by Matabel Gittinger. It really produced, in my mind, some of the most significant research into data on Indonesian textiles. And there were many questions posed at the end of that. And I hope that my book has been able to answer some of those. So first, we're going to look to the past. Cultures are templates for the society of the day. We see this, we see this across history back over 2000 years. Bronze statues are the most durable and universal of art forms. The artisans carved drapery and depicted patterns cast into bronze or carved in stone. These sculptures across from the ancient world are just a few examples that I've collected over the years showing carved patterns. And they highlight the ingenuity of the artisans across the past millennia. The tectile examples, which do remain, however, Certainly in the, in the world of Southeast Asia, only reflect a tiny slice of the history of no more than two to 300 years at the most. However, the stone and bronze statues that you're going to see appear as the templates for some industries for the production of contemporary statues and contemporary textiles. So pattern splendor, how to begin? How did I begin with this book um, when I decided to work on stone and bronze statues? So this slide is really looking at two sculptures almost to scale, except the, uh, the little Vishnu at the bottom would actually only reach up to barely the pedestal at all. 
So it would be even smaller than this. So you imagine you're trying to work with something of these two sizes. And I wanted to relate and understand the textile patterns that were going on in this. And I couldn't do it just from the drawings themselves. So I needed to draw the patterns and I needed an artist. So I found an artist at the Royal College of Art, a young lady, Yiran Huang, a Chinese girl um, who was doing a, um, a, an MA in art design. And she and I worked together over a four year period um, to create these designs. And her brief was basically, look at the central Javanese statues of which you're going to see many, but most of them were small, mostly between 10 and 20 centimeters lift the textile off the body, just the lower half of the body, and create it. It looked as though it was an item of dress. You're going to see more of these, of course. And then in the East Javanese statues, please take the textile off the body and create it as a flat sheet, as though it was a textile itself, which is what you see here. But firstly, maps. Uh, the publisher, when I started this book, said, you must have your own maps, um, don't copy anybody else's. So during the lockdown last year, I found um, Oxford Cartographer Limited and worked with a gentleman called Mick and he and I never saw each other. We never spoke. We did the whole thing by email um, and we created these four maps, which was quite a challenge because I hadn't a clue what to do. But this map covers the geographical region which spans from China in the east and Persia in the west, which you can't see on this. But it places Java and Sumatra at the heart of this region. The trade to and from these two islands was connected by trade with the Indo-Persian world, passing on to China and, of course, through the Straits of Malacca. This southern coastal region of Sumatra lies on direct and unobstructed path from southern Chinese ports to the Straits of Malacca, which really no other Indonesian island enjoys this situation. There was a very interesting um, current article in the Rec Watch magazine, which came to my attention, which is an online journal. Just recently, and a 12th century writer wrote, quote, most important meeting point of the maritime routes from the foreign countries was situated on the banks of a waterway, and they were referring to Srivijaya. And he put also, quote, larger than the Tigris at Basra, unquote. And Persian traveler noted the importance of the inhabitants at this region, who lived on floating rafts on, on the rivers, um, on the Musi River, which is at the entrance to Srivijaya, nowadays Palembang. So this is how people live in Palembang now, though they're not floating, they are actually in stilts to the ground. But basically their livelihood and much of what they did has changed over the few thousand years. But ancient Palembang was referred to as Srivijaya or Samfochi or Zabag by Persian realm. So what are the periods we're looking at? We have two dynastic periods in this book. So it was divided into Central Java and East Java. The central Java statues, as you see on the top left here, are made up of silver, gold, and uh, silver, bronze, and gold, and in stone. So there's quite a variety from size and material. But when we come to East Java, um, we're dealing basically only in stone, except for there is a, a small group of early East Java, which I won't go into in this lecture, that are in, excuse me, that are in bronze. So how did I begin this whole project? I was a postgraduate student at SOAS and went on my Southeast Asia module to the museum in Leiden, which is the museum you see at the bottom here. Um, these, these statues here, I'm going to put up my pointer, just a moment. And they are decorated with textile designs that nobody had written about. So they had been published before these sculptures, but nothing more had been done. Um, when I started the PhD um, with Elizabeth, I decided that I had to look at these statues and work out what was going on. So at the end of each chapter of the book is um, these templates done of, of the different designs that are recording all of the statues that have been going through the book. So from a student's point of view, you can easily do a ready reckoner as to the different variety and designs, and we'll look at more of those in a moment. Durga is an interesting sculpture. If you look at the two pictures on the left, they come from here, the Baker drawings, and in the Raffles history book, um, the history of Java. And then, of course, the actual Durga herself here. And I've cut off the background so you can't see where she's situated. But so interesting, when this was actually published, uh, nobody discussed the textile design. Nobody had a look at what was done. And Yuren did the drawings of the upper body garment, and then the three textiles that appears on her dress. 
Now, in the original, in the 18th, the 19th century, they had a problem, and I've got a nice little tool here to show you. If you bring this up close, if you look at the, the picture on the left, you'll notice that the skull designs don't appear, but in the actual drawings themselves, if I bring this down, there are skulls designed in her kit cloth. But in Raffles' time, people didn't know what they were looking at. Nothing was ever written about this, so they really had no idea what was going on during this period. So let's have a look at the two different styles. So from Central Java and then East Java. So it was quite evident for the Central Javanese bronze that the only way to, to look at what was going on was to lift the, the textile and the lower body garment off the sculpture and create a drawing. Yiran did such a beautiful job, and I've just had um, the book reviewed by an American lady um, who gave three or four lines to Yiran and say what a fantastic work she did and that she actually brought the whole book to life. But what was important also, I think, about this project is this little Trelok of Ajaya is in the um, store in Leiden, and it's never been seen before, it's never been published. No one has any idea what they're looking at here. But what's interesting, if you look at these two sculptures with about four, five hundred years between, you're dealing with an Indian type of dress here. This is something totally um, South Asian, whereas on the, the piece on the left, you're dealing with something that's completely Javanese that has absolutely no impact from India at all. And with these detailed textile patterns that you're noticing here, this type, this sort of design will appear again further on through the lecture, um, the Kowong textile pattern, and we'll talk more about that um, in a while. So how was I going to bring the central Javanese sculptures together? Um, Obviously, you have them in a, in a geographical period and a historical timeline, but you're really dealing with about 150 years, and there were a lot of sculpture between gold, bronze, and stone. How was I going to categorize these? And it took me a long time to work out what to do with these. So in the long run, I worked out that I wanted to categorize them in flower designs, in pattern designs. Um, the, the book review that just came out said um, made one comment and said, perhaps I could have been more convinced that the designs actually told us the uh, chronology for the sculpture. But however hard I tried, it didn't actually work that way because there was no set chronology, um, which was a shame. I would really have liked that to have happened. But what I'd like you to look at whilst we go through these is to look at the different style of the, the um, sartorial dress on this. So the sculpture, the Manjushri on the right, you're dealing with a typical Indian dress. It's seated in a classic pose, and you'll notice that the hip wrapper finishes right here at the knees. So it's a short dhoti in the Indian style. But on these two, this is absolutely Javanese. What this sculpture is wearing is dressed in something called a dodot, which is the long ceremonial garment, a batik cloth that is worn over a trouser. Now, I'm not saying this is batik at all. I'm saying this is a type of a large garment. It's the first time we see this type of garment worn that is very typically Javanese and has absolutely nothing to do with Indian design at all. So the same simple design appears on these two Ganesha, for example. Now that Ganesha on the right is still in the National Museum and it's a very fine example, beautifully cast, um, very clear design. But the piece on the left, um, we just found in the Sonobodoya Museum a couple of years ago, it was actually covered in a plastic bag because he was being washed and it was, he was complete rubbish and we couldn't photograph him. We went back a couple of years later and he was out of his bag, but still stuck in the back corner. And it turned out he had a beautiful textile design. So sculptures like this don't get published. People only publish generally the pretty ones, the really good ones. So what I hope is that what this book has before at all. So this, three, this group is quite an interesting. We still have the same, um, the same simple floral design, but two, the outside two statues remain in situ in Java and the middle one in the Santa Barbara Museum. Now, again, that's not being published anywhere. Santa Barbara were um, very happy to see this as a full page in the book. Um, and I hope to write a small article just about this piece for them. But the statue on the left, the Augustia, remains um, very hard to find at Chandi Ijo. It's down a hill. 
um, surrounded by a cage of barbed wire with, you know, do not enter. And I have to say, um, Dick and my husband is here, of course, ignored that and entered to take the photographs. But if you don't do these things, how will we ever bring this to life? And this statue will eventually crumble to nothing. So at least we've been able to preserve it. But what I want to highlight is the style of the dress here. There is a particular feature in central Java where the sash here at the front of the body folds over. This is the one distinctive feature that appears only in central Java. So it's something to look for when you move further into East Java, that doesn't happen at all. So there are certain things that you can look at that create a timeline. And also the, the way the sash here, the way the sash is tied on the side of the body is in East Java, it becomes much bigger and much more blousy, really, um, in appearance. So another one of the designs is referred to as circles and dots, as I'm not a very dramatic title, but what else to do with circles and dots? Um, I feel we're looking at the, so the furthest inspiration of using some form of bantony or tie-dye textile, or even um, the blue at the bottom is, is a block printed. And you see from the title, this comes from the, um, the Newbury collection at the Ashmolean that Ruth Barnes um, did all her work on many years ago. And we know that these types of Indian block printed textiles were traded in huge quantities to Fushtat, where they were found in Egypt, but they also came in quantities to Sumatra and Java. So I pose that these sculptures are replicating something. The, the sculptor is not making them up. It's something that was happening at the time. But I'd like to draw your attention to this little Manjushi, which is just the most beautiful piece. It's probably Indian, but it was found in Java. But there is also the possibility that it was made in Java, um, but by an Indian craftsman, because the physiognomy of the sculpture is very Indian. But um, or they have to, I should use the word from the parlor, Eastern India. India is much too general a term. But the dress style that we see down here, that with the, you can see from the pattern, doesn't appear in any of the parlor pieces. So the inspiration is very much Javanese. And the little Brahma on the left would not appear like this in South India or in Eastern India anywhere. Nobody makes gold statues like this, this period. So this is a typical Javanese piece in very much in Javanese dress. Then we move to a slightly more complex. This band um, in horizontal bands is a far more sophisticated design. Now, Wiseman Christie in her work really follows this through. She calls these compound complex patterns. Um, there's a lot of research being done into um, the, the weavers, the type of loom, um, the people who were there actually weaving, and we know that there is much terminology to show that there were people making warp ikat at this time, and that they use blue and red dyes, which is what warp ikat is made in um, primarily, and is mostly today in Eastern India, I Indonesia, sorry. And the picture at the bottom shows new, new um, ikat from a market in Ende, but it gives you an idea of the type of textile that we're looking at. But I also propose that these, especially this gold piece up here, um, I'm going to use my little, because I want to highlight this for you, you bring this up, that this textile here has nothing to do with ECAT. This, the, the, and this is not Shiva and Parvati, this is just a royal couple. So things like this would never be made in India. This is typically Javanese aspect. So it's two arms, so you know it's secular, it's not a sacred object. The type of garment he's been wearing is some kind of gold brocade or possibly um, stamped with Prada afterwards and drawn with, um, with a, ten, a tulis pen. But you're dealing with something that's very, very um, local and indigenous to the islands. But I'm going to take you to this picture for a moment um, and just think about something else that was happening. And I just need to read you for a little bit. On close observation, some of the 9th to 10th century central Javanese patterns also appear to be reflected in later designs on statues of the 11th and 12th centuries from Kashmir and Tibet. And in paintings such as this green tower from the Cleveland Museum of Art. The Javanese appear to be willing recipients of ideas from India, ideas that were subsequently absorbed and incorporated. These ideas seem to be part of a two-way relationship. How to explain the complex compound patterns on the Javanese bronzes, which were also visible on one Sri Lankan bodhisattva that I found in the National Museum in Colombo, which I have not included here. Connections between regions were probably triggered by royal patronage, 
from the 10th to 12th centuries by a network of relationships between South Asia, East Java, Cambodia, Central Sumatra, and Champa in Southern Vietnam. But by the 11th to 13th centuries, the connections were felt through a renewed focus on esoteric Buddhism. I'd just like to quote you a little bit from the famous scholar, um, J.G. de Casparis, who wrote, among the Indian Nagapatanam bronzes, a number apparently show Indonesian influences, suggesting that Indonesian influence can be observed in some of the Nalanda bronzes. So really what I wanted to highlight is that we're looking at Java as being the, the heartland and the, the, the inspiration for much of what we see in, in Tibet and in Eastern uh, Northeast India. So I'll bring you back to Java. Now this is referred to as the Boro or the Bara Ganesha, and it's probably the most famous of all the Javanese Ganesha and the one that I hate the most. Um, to me, it's the ugliest thing that I've ever seen. Um, it, he's really a composite. Um, the famous scholar Pot describes it probably made in, in two or maybe even three different versions that things were added and that the base, the asana was added at, at a different time and probably the kala on the back of the body. So why would you make a Ganesha like this? Um, with a really interesting textile pattern, very detailed, you can see from the drawings and my detailed photograph in the middle, with a collar on the back. Now, please note when you're looking at this, this Ganesha is in the typical Shaivite style with a tooth in one hand, and you can't quite see it, but he has his sweetie bowl in the other hand. Typical Ganesha iconography. And this is going to change considerably as we move on into East Java. But what I want to bring up to here is this is the first time we see this really detailed co-woven pattern. This is what this design is called in Java. This interconnecting circles is not new. It's actually known right back to the Harappan days, you know, 2000 years ago. We also see it in China. We see it in Myanmar. In fact, it's everywhere. If you look for this design today, it's everywhere. But for the Javanese, it had a different meaning. Every country had its own meaning. And here it was, the Javanese concept of manchapat is really a compass card structure of four five. And the structure reflects many elements as the roots of manchapat are pre-Hindu and really come from Austroasiatic um, language speakers. And it's really how is this interpreted? And this concept of the four five, which actually can be made nine, is the concept of the compass point. And it was really um, very important to the Javanese um, ethos as to where their villages were laid out, the way the king was placed in the middle, even how they field um, their rice fields. So I'll just take you back to India for a moment. Many pilgrims and monks from China and Southeast Asia visited these sacred sites of Buddhism. The last stronghold of Buddhism in India, such as the monastery and university of Nalanda and Vrikramshila in Bihar. This is um, Nalanda. However, during the Hindu Buddhist period in Java and Sumatra, the most significant influence was general felt from Northeast India as the main starting point of Indian artistic inspiration. However, Indonesia derived its ideas of Indo culture from contacts with many regions of the Indian subcontinent. For example, Hinduism, specifically Shaivism, arrived with contacts with South and Western India over many hundreds of years. But I'd like to emphasize that I described earlier, patterns and ideas also traveled in reverse to India, as we will see with the coming slides. So the next map of Central Java, this really shows you where all the sculptures in the book from Central Java, where they're placed, the name of the sculpture and the different chandi or the different site where they originated from. And it really highlights that the, 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 the greater amount of them are in Central, here in the plains of Prambanan and Borobudur which were the key um, sites of Buddhist and Shaivite activity. It was quite a challenge producing a map like this to get the locations correctly by having to get the GPS points for the different um, sites. So there, it's as accurate as it, can, as it can be. So I want to take you to central Java for a while. For those of you who don't know the Chandis, to have a look at the type of monuments and buildings that these sculptures were destined for. So in central Java, we have Borobudur and Prambanan, Buddhist and Hindu Chandi, that are a complete departure from anything seen in India, but they still have very much an Indian ethos and ascetic to them. And then when you move to East Java, things change completely. So Chandi Jago at the top one and Chandi Singhasari are the two where the two key 
groups of sculptures originate from. So the, the Chandi Jago is Buddhist, and in fact, even in Raffles' time, it looked like this. So nobody's ever had a picture of it in a more complete version than this. But Chandi Singh Asari in Raffles' time um, was really a pile of stones, and they did actually manage to reproduce it, but it was never really finished. And then right through the end of the Majapit period is, is Panataran, which is the state temple. It's actually just a plinth or a platform, and it would have had a, a wooden superstructure on the top of it. Now, all of these, apart from Singh Sari, in fact, all of those Chandi have fantastic mile upon mile of relief architecture all the way around them, except for Singh Sari, which was unfinished. So I suspect it probably would have had them too. So it's this Chandi that's of the most interest to the sculptures you're going to see more of. So I'm going to take you to Sumatra briefly. Um, you might ask, I could have just done this whole paper and book just on Java, but I could not leave out these four important sculptures and sites in Sumatra. So these are the four sites in Sumatra where the four sculptures that are of interest. Um, but the two that we're particularly going to look at is the top left, the pressure parameter, from, from this Chandi Gumpung site. And I went with my husband there for a conference, the first um, conference. In fact, it was the only conference they ever had. Um, it was quite a fas fascinating place, absolutely fascinating, right on the, the, the river, right in from Marajambi. And at the bottom right is a, an archer. This is an ancestor figure. This um, is in, in a white tough stone, volcanic stone, very similar to the stone in Bali. Whereas the one on the top, the pressure parameter is in a volcanic, in a, also a volcanic stone, but a much smoother gray stone. So we have the, the million dollar question as always, was anything imported? Were they all made here? Were they made in Java and brought into um, Sumatra? This is what's been in dispute constantly. And just to highlight to you a little bit of context of what happens in Java, we have volcanoes, um, chandis and rice. Wherever you go in East Java, that's what you see everywhere. But it's what we see at the top. And the scholar Hadi Sidamolio, um, a good friend who lives in Bali, has spent many years studying the architecture of East Java and temples, and especially Mount Penagunan. And he, he wrote the recent book called Tantu Panjalaran, and it came out just before mine, actually, with the same publisher. And he strives Penagunan as five peaks associated with Mahameru from India. So all of you have your Indian scholarship behind you, I know, and that this is the most important mountain as to all Javanese, but strangely enough, the smallest. Um, but when the clouds are not there, it is very distinct that you actually see five peaks. I wrote a small piece for um, a Dutch magazine um, last year, actually two years ago, on lost patterns. Um, I'm very concerned about sculptures that will disappear completely into, in the atmosphere of Indonesia. So these two on the top right is the, the remaining legs of a Dick Parlo, which is the, one of the guardians of the, the, the universe. And this was published by Brandes in 1909, the sculpture in the top right. And when I went to visit it again, sort of 120 years later, the patterning has almost completely disappeared. So I just want to show you this. Um, If you look at that, you can actually see the design really carved quite carefully onto the stone. But you notice how the, the and I go up this way, when you look at the original Brandis picture, it's quite clear. So I felt when I did this small article on lost patterns, it was very important to see what's going because it, it will disappear. The weather will take it or school kids will have jumped all over it or something else will happen to it. Now this other sculpture, if, I note, if you notice here, you can actually see the textile design just faintly down the legs. But Yuran was such a brilliant artist, when you notice close up, that she was able to interpret this. And it's a very complex, beautiful design. There are quite a few similarities of this type of patterning through this region. So this would have been um, a, a deity, a royal deity. We know from, we can see from her ornamentation that this was an important piece. And I felt very strongly by putting pieces like this into the book that nobody would think about, not published, why would you publish something that's so damaged? Because if we don't do that, they'll be lost forever and nobody will ever know about them. So I'll bring you back briefly to central Java, um, to these two. This is a pair of Shiva and Parvati that's in the National Museum. 
So if we think about everything I've told you before about um, different um, designs and different iconography and sartorial style, the shiver on the left is absolutely looks dressed in an Indian style. Um, he's got the sash coming out of the side of the body, which is very clear from the drawing as to what's going on. He wears a dhoti pulled up between his legs, tucked in behind. Whereas the poverty on the right, apart from the chanavira, which is the cross chains across between her breast, this is totally um, a Malay or Javanese style of dress. So once again, I'm going to bring this in for you because I want you to see this close up. You'll notice here how the dress is folded over. I mean, this type of dress is not worn in, in India at all. Nobody would ever dress for something coming to the, to the calves this way. So th this for me is the first evidence of any type of dress of this form. And with this particularly unusual textile pattern, and for those of you who have any knowledge of textiles from this region, this looks like a tapis from the Lampung region in South Sumatra. And this design we refer to as kumi kumi. It's a, either a squid or a um, um, uh, cuttlefish. Sorry, trying to get the word out. So what's it doing on a sculpture in Java? We have nothing else in Java like this. How did it get there? Was it made in Sumatra and then traded to Java? There are so many questions that you could pose to this, but this is the only one, one sculpture. How did anyone come up with a design to make it like this? There had to have been something that was there at the time. In 2016, um, Dick and my husband and I went to Russia was the highlight of my research. We finally made it after much paperwork and huge expense and nerves that we'd actually gated in to see two sculptures, this one and the next one. This had never been published before, except in German in, with a picture about an inch and a half high um, in around 1900. Um, and, and the whole text had been written in German, was translated by a friend of mine, I took a gamble that there had to be a textile pattern on this. We didn't know that when we got to Russia, what would be appear on this particular statue. But this is a representation of the young King Krishnagara. So he was the final king of the Singhsari dynasty from Chandi Singhsari, that unfinished Chandi that I showed you. So this is a Hindu Buddhist king. He saw himself as both Shaiva and Buddha. He practiced tantric practices but he, his Chandi was Shaivite, everything it was Shaivite. We don't know where this statue came from. We don't know where it was situated. What niche we was in, we know nothing about it at all. All I can do is show you more detail of the sculpture. So Yuran actually in this one did a drawing of the lower half of the body to really highlight. He's absolutely adorned in huge amount of ornaments. This was all gold jewelry. Um, he wears two hip cloths. That's why you see the drawing at the top actually shows two different border patterns. There are many texts that Wiseman Christie um, has translated that talks about red silk sinjans. The word for this long cloth that's worn to the ankles is a sinjang in this part in East Java. The use of the tumple border, this is what you see here, for those of you who don't know. This is isosceles triangle is the word of tumple. But what's interesting is it doesn't appear on any of the sculptures, and that fascinates me. It's in the text, the word temple, but the artisans decided never to interpret that. But we also have another textile here. This design, um, which I refer to as the banshee pattern, is something that it's, it's comes from China. It's also Shaivite as well, but in this instance, it's very much Chinese influence. This is um, a Lokchan silk scarf um, that is made in north coast of Java and traded extensively to Bali and Sumatra. And this motif, this banji pattern, appears quite considerably in architecture and relief carvings in Bali and Java. So the other sculpture that took me to Russia is the one that's on the front of the book, the Manjushri. Manjushri Arapachana is really the most wonderful of all the statues um, in this region. And it's in perfect condition, apart from slight damage to the fingers. What's interesting is it had been collected so 150 years ago, so not remaining outside, but it went on um, exhibition for three months, then back into store. Other than that, it's not been seen. So Raffles published it, Brandes published it, and one or two others, but in the, in the 20th century, nothing. So this is the first time this statue has come back to life again. 
Um, that's why I decided to place it on the front of the book. Um, the Russians were very happy, I have to say, and demanded two copies <laughs> as a penance for putting it on the front cover, which I thought was a bit rich. Um, but what's so interesting about it, did you see from the drawing that Yiran did, the most extraordinary textile design, what is going on on this statue? Where did all this come from? The complete departure from central Java, nothing that we had seen before appeared like this. So remember, this king, this was created in this period, saw himself as both Shiva and Buddha. So this, this sculpture came from Chandi Jago, which was a Buddhist sanctuary. Now it appeared nowhere within the main Chandi. It probably had his own shrine all to himself. And there's a whole story about this statue that really doesn't fit into this lecture. So I can't go into it too much now. But what I want to show you is that the different ideas, if you look at the textile design in the bottom left, where did this inspiration come from? Was it all, was it all imported or was some of it indigenous? There's a lot of relief architecture in central and east Java that covers this uh, um, ever-flowing lotus design that continues, that goes round and round, or recalcitrant spiral, as some uh, old Javanese scholars have described it. Even relief architecture in Pagan, in the bottom right, has the same type of lotus design that appears. So I think what you're seeing on here is a combination of indigenous designs. Oh, sorry. Um, plus something that's come in from Central Asia. These patterns here, um, these ones and the elephant, these um, mythical animals that are very familiar on Sogdian and Sasanian textiles from the sort of 7th, 8th century, that is contiguous with the Tang period, and the Tang traded huge quantities of textiles into this region. So this sculpture, just imagine one sculpture sits alone like this. Where did all of this come from? You know, no sculptor didn't wake up in the morning and says, I'm going to just draw these pretty designs. It had to have represented something. So I show you these two parts of the body, sorry for the body parts, but the upper one, these both these come from Chandi Singh Asari. So we're dealing with East Java now, something that's very Javanese, anything Indian or Pala has completely disappeared here. Um, in fact, I should go back. Just one thing I wanted to say. Mm, back is not possible. We can do it afterwards. Is these, these two statues are representing, um, on this one, he's wearing an upper body garment. You'll notice that there is a, dis a distinct line down through the middle and the garment finishes at the shoulder. So through all my um, empirical research by actually being there with the statues and Yiran came with us to Leiden, that she was able to make the drawings for these quite clearly. So what you notice from the, the Wang Wang dancer, that's from a 1912 book at the top, that he is wearing the same type of upper body garment. Um, soldiers in Bali wear garments like this. So this upper body garment is the first evidence we have of this in Java or Bali is on these 13th century statues. And at the bottom, this is the same, they are both guardian figures at Singasari. He wears a, a hip cloth with a design that's probably this Gurinsing. We know from the text again that um, a kind Gurinsing or Gurinsing Kawong or Xinjiang Gurinsing Kawong are the words that come up time and time again. And I've interpreted this textile is what's being made here. So the Gurinsing is made in, in Bali, in East Bali, and was traded in huge quantities to Java because it was a protective textile, was seen as something used by royalty only. And these were guardian figures, hence the need for protective textile. So Ganesha, so I hope you remember that, what I call the borrow Ganesha, the one I didn't like. So this Ganesha, which I think is wonderful. So he is now related to Chandi Singh Asari. Um, so it's part of the same pantheon that belonged to the key king. You're now seeing a tantric Ganesha. If you notice the tusk has disappeared, there is no tusk. You see his hand is in a bowl on both sides and you can see from the raffles drawing. But what's interesting from, from the raffles drawing is they weren't quite sure what they were looking at. They got a pretty looking skull and some sort of pretty pictures going on in between, but they didn't really know what they were drawing here. But when you look at, um, you look at the drawing that Yiran made, you can see that there is something else happening here. This was a one-eyed Kala. 
Now, this is a feature that's completely unique to East Java. And that feature you've seen here on a relief that comes from, that's in Trovaland Museum. So this image, and now you can see that on, on the lake here, it's quite clear. So these Ganesha are wearing trousers. We know the word um, trouser and not a kind is Kalambi, and it's been written in, in text by um, a scholar called Jiri Jackal, who's done a lot on um, Javanese sartorial dress. But these, these Ganesha also have um, skulls in the earrings. He has skulls in his head, and of course, they're seated on skulls. And the skulls appear only in this period, just in this short 50 years, at end, end of the East Javanese period. The pressure parameter. This sculpture on the right is probably the most famous of all Indonesian sculptures. Um, sorry, it's not a particularly good picture. When we first went to see her, she was on display in the National Museum years ago. Then they had a burglary and they closed all the, the treasures room down and then they stuck her in a glass box with lights shining at her at all angles and it was impossible to photograph her. But this is the, the museum's um, standard picture that comes out. Now you could probably say to, safely say that they could hardly tell there's any textile interest going on here at all. But the two, two drawings here, this is her hip cloth, and then this represents a sash that goes across um, her belly, basically, and lays over her thighs and folds down to the side of the body. And I've studied this sculpture for many, many years now, and it's probably the most complex of all of the designs that came up. But if you look at the one on the left, which remains in situ, it's much larger, much lumpier, not nearly such a beautiful statue um, and can very damaged, but has a really detailed design. So this design here belongs to this statue. If I bring it in close, I'm afraid you can't even notice it, but from my close up photographs that I took by actually being there, Yiran was able to make the drawing. So once again, you know, this thing will just disappear. Nobody will think anything of it of it by, in, unless we were able to reproduce them. So these two images are quite interesting. They're a few thousand miles apart. The, the Karangatis Ganeshu, who remains in situ um, outside um, the Malang region in Java, and then the huge Mahakala that was found in Sumatra, that I showed you a picture of right at the beginning, was fallen down on the ground. But our interest in these two is his hip wrapper. So, um, again, I have to bring you close in. There is a line here and a line here just above the thighs. And these two gentlemen are both wearing a cloth like this that we see on the left here. So this is called um, Chandra Kapala. It's really the skull eating into the, into the moon and the tusks. Now, the scholar Pauline Nussing Schuller has done a lot of work on this already, and it has been written about before. But why do these statues, are they depicted like this? And as far as I can work out, um, my research into Ganesha, and there was another scholar, Eddie Sediwati, who wrote a lot about Ganesha in Kediri and Singasari, that this Ganesha was out as a, put in the realms of Malang as a protector. He was there to protect the kingdom. So skulls are seen as a form of protection and a symbol of royalty and also a symbol of the graveyard. So we're dealing with a king who is interested in the graveyard because he practiced tantric practices. So you, you'll notice from this, he has skulls in his earrings, even his belt around his waist has a little skull in the head of it. And of course he's placed on skulls. Whereas this Mahakala, there are no other skulls in his iconography, only on the hip wrapper. But here's a bit of an anomaly and something odd is going on here because I'm going to bring it in again. Um, the sash at the side of the body here is not the same pattern. Now, naturally, if you're going to make a cloth, you put the, the cloth around your hips, one design, and then you might have the belt similar design or you might leave it plain. But in this instance, the design is a very sophisticated patterning that is almost identical what's found in the Minang people from West Sumatra. And it's this quite an extraordinary story. And there's a gentleman who's done the work actually produced this songket, made it copying this actual text down. And once again, it's another tale that would, you know, take me half a lecture to explain as to how the connections are here. But I'm just showing you the variations that were going on at this time. And we come near to the end to the Brahma. So this piece is in Leiden in the Volkenkund Museum. 
Um, it only went on display a few years ago um, when they redid the museum. But it's a really interesting design that's only visible just in a small detail on the lower left leg. The rest of the statue is quite worn away. But it's, a, it's an intriguing pattern because it, it represents something called the Karahana flower, which is something that we see in the Tang Dynasty. Um, appears a lot, and, and the, the drawing of the famous harp player at the top is from Takibustan um, in Central Asia. It's almost identical when you look at Yirang's drawing with these two comparisons here. But what's intriguing in um, Myanmar, when you look at the lot of the, roof, the paintings and the roof paintings, you see many of the kings, I'm sure Elizabeth would be able to tell us more about that, with concentric circles, touching circles of these same type of floral design. So, you know, once again, with this highlights the connections that were going on at this time, how Java and Sumatra were part of this hugely interconnected, you know, international world. The Pratchett Parameter, um, this was published in Brandis's book um, in 1909, where they actually thought that this was a figure of Tara or Lakshmi. So when you look at her today, this is how she looks now. And the damage is much the same, but she has this terrible water stain down the front of the body. But this is definitely a poverty. And again, I'd love to tell you more and explain why, but we don't have time in this lecture to tell you why. I know it is a poverty. But what I'm interested in is her textile. At the front of the body, you can see that she is, would have been carved in a really detailed pattern with these circles. But what? But when you look to the side of the body, when I first saw this, I really excited and thought, my goodness me, something is going on here. If you can get your eye keyed in to what's going on inside the red circles, there's a duck, a duck, a duck in central, in East Java. Where on earth did the duck come from? So the only way I was going to find out an answer to this is I went to Switzerland to the Abbe Stiftung Foundation, and they gave me a scholarship place for four days to research um, Central Asian textile patterns. And that's where I learned about all that was going on with the Sasanian and Sogdian designs, where the duck was so important, um, with symbols of royalty. You have um, lions and deers and peacocks were always seen within these concentric touching circles, sometimes with Pearl Randall, sometimes without. So can you imagine what this queen poverty would have looked like in a rich when she was first made? It was been just extraordinary. So I've shown you some examples of where other ducks appear from um, Jain manuscripts to Central Asian textiles. And then this group from Ajanta, again from Takibustan, where the duck is carved onto the reliefs, and also on Indian trade textiles, block printed textiles in the bottom, where the duck appears constantly. Now I had a bit of debate with um, Hetty Elgood, um, also my tutor, at one stage, as to the word Hamza versus duck, these are ducks and not Hamzas. Um, I've done a lot of research into the difference. I think they are not a Hamza. So if anyone wants to dispute that, I'm happy to go into that too. So back to Sumatra. This piece um, is a really interesting piece and has a own story behind it. We have here um, a seated Malay figure. This is an ancestor figure, so only two arms. All right, no, um, no upper arms at all, and holding a censer in the front. And you can see from the drawing at the bottom how small it is. It, was seated, it remains in situ in a small site museum at Bumiayu. So we visited once, takes hours to get there from Palembang because it's really in the middle of Sumatra. But the whole concept of this upper body garment is referred to as a baju in Malay language. And it's really um, a garment with or without sleeves used as a blouse or a robe or a tunic or a coat. And the baju in Javanese text comes from the early 11th century and Malay manuscripts from the late 14th century, this word is known. So this really gives us the first tantalizing evidence of Persian style inspired dress and, and textile pattern. So the baju was derived initially from the Persian word badzu and subsequently adopted into Malay language. The term kabaya used to describe a female blouse um, pinned together at the front. In this instance, it has um, probably a, a, a cloth belt with a metal plaque on it holding it together. So in today's um, Malay language, an upper body garment, whether with or without sleeves, is generally referred to as a baju. 
So we are really seeing the earliest evidence of any form of Malay stroke Persian dress. Now we know from um, research, there's um, a place on the Northwest coast of um, Sumatra where there was a great um, Persian trading port that came in. We know from ceramics that the Persian material was here. And something that I know Stephen was involved in was the Tang cargo at the ACM. And this ewer, along with many dishes, display this particular design of the um, incised straw lozenges and clouds, the Tang material. This is a typical Persian type of material that I think we, we're beginning to see on the textile. So this is a, a complete departure from anything in Java um, and also anything in the Malay world. It's, they're a one-off um, on their own. So right at the end, the pressure parameter, I have to bring you back to her. Um, she was um, supposedly placed at the top of Chandi Gumpung. I'm holding my hands up now. If you imagine something as a Chandi that's, say, 10 inches high, and then put a sculpture on it, it would look about 10 centimeters, if that doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? You wouldn't carve a huge brick chandy and stick a tiny little sculpture right on the top of it that nobody can see or get to. That makes no sense. And this chandy is also carved in the round. This is what you're noticing here is the sash across her legs is tied in this huge bow on the back of the body. It's an extraordinary sculpture. Sadly, her head is gone and her elbows have broken off. But I propose that the, this patterning is the leg on her main cloth here is, is unfinished. Um, it's too simple. It doesn't work for me. It just doesn't have the sophistication that other sculptures do. But what I'm interested in particularly is this border design. And I'll bring you in. If we look on the legs of the sculpture up here, you'll notice the border design. Um, appears at the end of her kind that's here, this one here. It also appears at the end of the kind up here. And that's what we're seeing in here in the, in the drawing. But on these two uh, Sonket Limar textiles down the bottom here, this is the earliest evidence we're seeing of the same thing on the Sonket. I spend a lot of time with this um, and talk to a lot of Malay scholars who feel very much with me that this is what we're noticing. So this sculpture was strongly influenced by Chinese um, traders. This was a, a very strong Chinese port on the east coast of, southeast coast of Sumatra. We have a lot of textiles here. Um, her sash across her body looks like a, a Ming embroidery, which is slightly later than this, but Chinese embroidery. There's nothing Javanese or Indian about this textile at all. So this is a very much Malay Chinese style. So an East Java map shows you where all the Chandis were for East Java. Um, the greater group of them are all based around the Brantas River, um, where the two volcanoes here, um, this is with the heart of the Singasari period, um, and, and the number of the Majapahit hit ones as well. So at the end of each chapter appear the sculptures and the drawings. And the number refers back to the, the actual sculpture in the book. So you'll notice the central Java, you see the lower half of the body. And then as you move on, you get a sheet or a cloth and how things change completely. And then right at the end, during the Majapahit hit period, you get the same repeated Kawung design, very simple, very simplistic. And then right at the end, you get these two pieces, which I'm not going to discuss at this stage. So at the end of the book, um, within the epilogue, I created this small um, map of the diaspora of the sculptures to show you where they're all situated today. Um, so there were 73 metal and stone sculptures in this book um, from the 8th to 15th century. Of these 73, 51 remain in Java and Sumatra today. So that's Chandi Singhasari again in the top left. And in 2016, um, one of our visits to this area, the Museum Singhasari was opened. Great excitement, I thought. Fantastic. You know, what are they going to put all the sculpture that are outside in the Singhasari? Unfortunately, that didn't happen. In fact, for a few years, it was completely empty. Nothing happened at all. Um, then I started looking on the internet um, about six months ago, and I find that it's full of replicas inside. So these are all replicas, um, photographs, and a replica of the Chandi itself. 
Um, my colleague, um, Echo Bastiwan, who had a scholarship here at SOAS, um, is now working in East Java. And I donated a copy of my book to this museum because they wanted to put a lot of the drawings up on the Chandis inside the museum itself. But a few months have passed and nothing's happened because I think they have no money, unfortunately. But hopefully next year when we get there, we can, we can make this work. So to conclude, in the last 120 years, we've had two world wars and many local political struggles for independence. During this period, the amount of scholarship has been, has been completed, but especially on East Java has been very minimal, important work, but very few compared to the previous centuries. Of course, these past works from the 19th century are either out of print, not available, or mostly in old Dutch or German and not accessible to the average student. In the current climate of decolonizing statues in European museums, all the original sculptures are either in the Museum National Indonesia in Jakarta or the Volkenkund in Leiden. And I see no reason that any of them are going to move from Europe back to Indonesia, certainly not in the current future. There's been no honest commentary in the past on sartorial dress of these two statues that you're looking at here, part of the original pantheon from Chandi Singhasari. On the contrary, they've been published many times without anything more being said, except possibly the word pattern garments or incised with a batik pattern, richly decorated, and nobody's really discussed it any further. The Raffles drawings at the top, published in the History of Java in 1817, are a reflection of how art was viewed during the 18th and 19th century. The plates in antiquarian publications showed carefully drawn monuments and antiquaries in their current ruined condition and technical drawings which became the established modus operandi of the antiquary. However, these statues were never really analyzed, nor was there any attempt to really understand why they were dressed and adorned in the way they were, a complete departure from anything ever seen in central Java. So I hope that my book has been able to draw on these past scholars, mostly on Raffles, Baker, Mackenzie, and Brandes, to highlight the ancient Indonesians on both Sumatra and Java had a rich textile tradition dating back longer than we ever thought. Patent Splendor has been able to bring to the reader something fresh and new, which has not been written about before in Javanese art historical tradition. And these rich patterns have been used today as templates for current textile production. Thanks very much for listening. I'll pass it over to you. Okay. Oh, no, just if there's, if people ask questions through the chat, I guess I can just see them from here, right? Yeah, yeah it's fine. I'll just call it chat up. All right. Yeah, it's fine. Oh. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Leslie. Uh, and thank you, first of all, for inviting me to respond to a few discussions in this talk um, to the Royal Asiatic Society as well. Um, yeah, I mean, really such a, I think, rich corpus of material. Um, I think you've really done a commendable job on just the, um, for me, I, was, I guess I'm just taken back by the depth of, of the depth and range of the material and the actual, I think like you've alluded to it on quite a few occasions that many of us have looked at this sculpture time and time again, we've seen it published, we've seen many of these examples published in, uh, in books or monographs, but there's never been any real discussion on the textile. And um, I think, yeah, it's something that's obviously been overlooked. And I think what, what Lizzie's, uh, not just her talk tonight, but the book shows is that when you actually start paying attention to these details, I mean, there's such a wealth of uh, information, material, and uh, uh, work that can be done and conclusions that we can be drawn on it. So yeah, I really, really commendable work. Um, it's really, it's made me look at these uh, sculptures um, anew actually and afresh. It's, it's quite remarkable that sometimes it, 
you have to have your attention drawn to something uh, before you really notice it. Um, and I think the book really does that. I think the, the illustrations are, like you say, are fantastic. That, that's really, I think, a major contribution to scholarship as well, that, that by actually pulling out each one individually, it now allows us to, um, to look at them in real depth. And, and, I, and I think by doing that, it, it raises new information, but then it also raises new questions that I, I suppose I can, I can pose. Um, I was, one thing that I've been thinking about, and I think a lot of scholars now are trying to, to look at it, is, is when we think of where influences are coming from, or, or who's influencing who. Of course, the sort of older scholarship, there was always this idea that everything was coming from India and so forth. Um, and then there's been a shift, obviously, over time to, to focus on Southeast Asia as well. Um, but it's always been difficult to pin down um, whether Southeast Asia, Southeast Asian material is influencing, whether it's Sri Lanka or, or, or South Asia or, or Tibet and so forth, um, to actually find the evidence. And I think in your talk tonight, you, you more than hinted at that and you've actually pinpointed some aspects of, of how these movements are actually going back. And I think, so I think that's like hugely significant as well um, to your talk. So maybe, um, yeah, on that point, before I pose the question, I was, again, I was just, I was completely unaware of the two sculptures at the Hermitage as well. So, yeah, <laughs> yes. fantastic pieces. And so, again, it's always nice just to be able to come to a lecture and, and even something as straightforward as that. And you're, All right, okay, there's, there's even more amazing stuff out there. So, that's, that's quite, quite helpful as well. But, yeah, maybe my first question then is, um, can you talk a little bit more then about um, how your work has shown uh, Japanese influence on either Tibet or, or, or India? Um, because I think obviously with textiles, the material doesn't survive, but what you've shown through the analysis, analysis of the sculpture is that we can see these influences going uh, either direction. I think, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for that. Um, it's, it's nice to know that I can put out something new that a scholar such as yourself still can say, yay, I've seen something different. Yeah, the whole, you know, Java India thing, I think when I showed you that, um, the Tara, the green Tara, and there are many paintings like that, um, many of them, and you look at these paintings, you think, yeah, that looks just like Java. Gosh, it must have influenced Java. Then you have to look at the dating. Do you remember the Java material is 9th, 10th century, and anything you see in the Tibetan world, which was post Pala, do you remember that when the Buddhism um, declined in Eastern India, everything went to Tibet, and so you're dealing with 12th, 13th century, especially 12th century is key. This is way later than the Javanese material, so, you know, how did it get there? Nobody was doing anything like that in Northeast India or in the Western India at that time. But we have these evidences in Sri Lanka, and I didn't put in this lecture, there's a beautiful Vajra Dharma in a um, seated piece, quite large. In fact, it's pretty substantial, isn't it? I think in the National Museum in Colombo, very similar textile design. So Sri Lanka was the jumping off point, of course, for uh, Buddhism, as you saw from the first map, it was part of the trade route to the south. So dating is important. You know, we just say, it looks like this, it looks like that, but what happened? You know, we've got to look at the dating, really. So hopefully that's the Great. All right. Um, I, have, I have one or two questions, and then maybe we can go to some in the, uh, the some already in the chat. Um, yeah, I was also interested in, um, yeah, one of, one of my questions, maybe this is more of a general discussion as well, it's a general question is, What's also fascinating what your work shows is that there's such there's this rich such a rich um, tradition of obviously not just textiles but carving on the sculptures from both central and, and eastern Java. And, and again, what sort of springs to mind to me then is is the absence of this in sort of other parts of Southeast Asia, like in like when you think of Angkor, right, which is this great whatever we want to call it civilization kingdom. It's they obviously have textiles as well and silks and, and probably similar things to what um, the Indonesians have. So do we get similar evidence on, you know, 
Khmer sculpture that I'm just, again, I'm just not lucky. I missed it because I'm not paying attention. But if it's not there, why, why, is, it, why is it not there? There is a real answer. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, Julian Green did a lot of work on Cambodian sculpture. Again, look at the dating. The important thing about Cambodia um, is 12th, 13th century, the height of Angkor, the Chinese man, Dajogan, there was a small book written about his visit to the court of Angkor. Um, and he would write about the, the Cambodians, they go down in their simple cloth and they wash by the river and the king had a lot of gold and people were simply dressed. And then the Siamese, they kept mentioning the Siamese. And the Khmer, the Khmer were not weaving at that stage. Mm -hmm. There was no weaving at all. There was a lot of Indian textiles being traded in, simple block printed textiles. But anything rich was made by the Siamese. For those of you who know Angkor, the, um, the Apsaras all have um, a long dress to the ankles and a simple floral design, quite similar to some of the ones I showed you. But the sash down the front is a heavily brocaded um, pattern that looks like a weave. And this was probably a Siamese fabric. So what you're having there is something that wasn't indigenous, whereas the Javanese, we know from text, they were weaving from early on. They had weavers, they had weavers who traded and moved around. They even sent their gold textiles back to China. They were trading back to China. The Chinese were buying cotton from Java that was traded in from India. So it was, you know, Java was a rich melting pot that Cambodia didn't have that sort of trade that was coming in and out. So that's the reason why we know the Javanese were doing so much, because we haven't written down. And that's why some Christie's work on the SEMA charters was so instrumental in me being able to launch this, basically. I read her work inside out and backwards, and you just don't get that in Cambodia. It's just not the same. So hopefully then, yeah, that that answers that. Amazing. Yeah, and I think actually that the, other, the other thing about your work, again, is because obviously the textiles don't survive, but by doing this analysis, you've shown, again, like how rich and how developed the actual textile industry within Java is. So it's, I think, again, it's a really good example of how, how scholarship can on the scholarship in this case on stone sculpture or on bronzes can actually open up this whole um, vista onto other mediums that we now you know don't have the evidence for. So I think that's really, really, really great. All right, I'm gonna take some questions from people in the chat. Um, let's go with uh, Claudine Bad Pikran. Um, do some of these patterns also are also observed in architectural ornamentation? Yeah, sorry. I presume she needs to also see these on, on architecture as well, like on temples and so forth. Um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yes, I know Claudine has done a huge amount of work on the parlor of, um, as we know, of Bengal and Northeast India. So, um, yes, when you looked at the Manjushri, of course, I showed you the relief architecture of the lotus design. But actually anything else, um, I'm hesitating, no. I, I actually really concentrated my work on freestanding sculpture. Mm. We started early on, um, we, I said, when Declan and I started this project together, was really to look at relief architecture as well with a whole different working <coughs> and it being covered so much. So there is some that reflects, but very little. Relief architecture, it's tiny in comparison and you can't get close to it, you can't study it as well. So basically, uh, my answer basically is no to that, apart from the Lotus design. That's about all, really. Mm, yeah, but it's, a, it's an interesting question and yes. observation as well. Mm. But they're quite specific. All right. Um, I think this question you pretty much answered. But yeah, what about the next one? Thank you so much for the presentation. I want to ask, are these kinds of fabrics and cloths still used in early Japanese Islamic era, i.e. the 16th century? <laughs> so maybe how, how much do these cloths continue on? When I was um, lectured in Singapore, the first one, the Singaporeans and the Malaysians are very interested in batik. That, that's, of course, that's their thing. Actually, we could ask you that question. <laughs> well, Where is the evidence for batik? batik? Where does that come? Because that's a good follow-up. Um, so the um, Wiseman Christie talked about tunis wana. Tunis is drawing with a pen and wana is color. And there's tunis mass or drawing with gold. So the early Javanese drew with a pen, with some kind of glue, and drew a design on a textile. We know they did that, then they would have put gold on using fish glue and made a gold design on the top. 
So the concept of batik probably developed only in about the 16th century when the Islamic courts came, when Central Java collapsed, East Java rose, that all collapsed, the Majapahit went to Bali, and Islam came in on the north coast of Java, as, and the central car of Java is called to Majaran developed. And the tradition of batik was there within the Javanese psyche, and they developed it into what it is. And it developed from that. So a combination of that's really when batik, as we know it today, started with the, with the, with the income of Islam, really. We have a question. Yes. Uh, fascinating. Uh, can you tell me, well, two questions actually for me. Firstly, uh, the stone carving, is there any evidence that it was ever coloured? And secondly, uh, it's very interesting your cartographic approach of rendering in two dimensions what on the statues is present in three. Is there any evidence that the reverse was true at the inception of the statues, that there were pattern books which were used and disseminated? Um, to the answer to the first one in colour, my husband <coughs> sitting there goes on and on about colour. Um, no, I research colour. There is no evidence the Javanese ever did colour at all. Even on the on the Chandi, we have no evidence of colour. It just wasn't in the Javanese way because the volcanic stone was such they didn't need to do that. So basically, no to that. Unless someone comes up with something, but no. And as far as the second one, um, pattern books. Hard to say. I'm not sure I can answer that. I mean, I firmly believe that the designs were replicated from something that they saw in front of them, not a pattern book, but something, maybe something else that come in, or there was textiles that were there. The Javanese were really into textiles. They always have been. That you can see that from the way they adorn their sculptures. So I think it was a very visual um, world. And they adorned their sculptures to represent royalty, basically. Um, that, that's how it was. So I think it was a visual from something they already had. But pattern books? Probably not. No, I don't think any, any record of that. No, not sure. And thinking about reaching further afield to Africa. Um, and this is the Kawan pattern, which is in the intersecting circles. Yes. Um, I know that that's referred to as Merkaba in Egypt, um, but I don't know much more about it. I think it's well, the, the Javanese traded batik in huge quantities to Africa. Um, they traded lots of things, but batik was very popular. So the Africans then made their own version of Javanese batik. So they made the designs went and it became something. You have to remember that interconnecting circles is synonymous with many, many countries, and every country sees it different. I mean, Elizabeth, when I was a child in Myanmar, I remember going to many of the, the temples, and around the image of the Buddha, there's always a band, a border, and it was always a one design. Everywhere you go, it's the same design. What did it mean to the Burmese? So, you know, everybody looks at this design and sees it differently. The Javanese had their own way. But yes, it probably came from Java. Any, any last yeah. Did you also look at the jewelry these figures yes. are wearing? Yes. Um, strange enough, I cut my art history teeth on jewelry. Um, I used to collect jewelry and study it and lecture on it when we lived in the Philippines years ago. So that was always there. Um, and someone actually, um, Peter Sharrock at SOAS, keeps wanting me to do a chronology of the statues based on their, their dress and their ornamentation as well. So you could do that, definitely. And it does change. That's actually quite easy to see a chronological path by looking at the jewellery, definitely changes. So, next project, but a few years down the line. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a, a comment and a question. I, 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 I'm sure you can take on a book, but no colour on the sculptures? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, it's because it was probably plaster and then certainly colored. I don't know. I just there is the strange thing is is that you know you go through all of the text and, and something would have been written. 
there. And honestly, not when they necessarily. maybe uh, not necessarily, but I've looked at those stones and everything, you know, as much as you're able to, there's absolutely no evidence and nobody else has ever found it. But it's just the detail of the carving is so fine. And, and the material is inherently porous. So mm -hmm. you, you want to compensate for that by enhancing it somehow. But but maybe one day we'll find it. I, 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 I certainly support your yeah, you're not evidence. Not so, but <laughs> you're a doctor. The conclusions was because they weren't using paint, and therefore they spent so much time on creating the paintwork as a three dimensional stone or, or metal carving. There is no point. In investing a fortune producing these extremely finely carved and, and, and molded objects, and to turn around then and to spoil that with a, a bunch of white plaster <laughs> and a whole bunch of paint. It's already there. <coughs> you don't therefore need to then paint it. The painted sculptures that we've seen in our travels have been pretty bland and flat surfaced. Sculptures. So those are the people whose patrons couldn't afford to get it properly, three-dimensionally engraved, as it were, and went for the cheaper option of slapping on paint. I think the, uh, the, the museum in Leiden would have found some. Mm. They've had them. They have chemical tested. They've had them tested. They've looked at it a long time. So I like to think they're never really yeah. <laughs> um, My other, my question, <laughs> part of the comment was um, of your three areas. If one looks at Central Java and, and East Java and Sumatra, to me, always the monumentality and the extraordinary, the iconography of East Java and East stand out. But then, but then there's your Pragnaparamita on in Sumatra, and I remember I, I don't know what went into the final thing, but did you still see a connection between, particularly between those two? Yes, well, th that was the reason we went to Jambi to the conference, and I, my paper that I did there was the two pressure parameter between the, the Singasari one, and you know, a number of scholars have liked to say that it was made, that the Mara Jambi one was made in Java and traded over, because mm. it was at the same time as King Krotanagara, and other scholars have said it's the same hand. <laughs> Personally, I think not. Personally, I don't think it's the same hand because the textile, the carving of the designs are quite different. And she, the, the Marajami one, is very heavily influenced by Chinese design for the, from the textile, from the patterning. Um, what we really would love to have done, and of course never come back to do, was to test the stone. And I even found a volcanologist in Birkbeck who gave me all the details and said, all you need to do is bring me a sliver. <laughs> But I don't think the Malays are very keen on us even taking a sliver. And he could tell whether it was stone, local stone or imported stone from testing volcanoes. So that would be, I would love to do that. But I think it's not the same. And I think it's earlier. I think it's slightly early, more about 1250, 1260, whereas the other probably 1290. Personally, might be more. Thank you. So if there's no other questions, then <laughs> I think we get all that's left. So this is the final lesson for most excellent talk tonight. Thank you.